Good morning. This is Ocean Community Church. It is Sunday, November 7th and November 8th, <laughs> and I'm Pastor Phil, and it's good to see you this morning. I'm glad that you're here, and uh, welcome from PD also, as uh, PD is uh, guest with us today again. So thank you for all of your thoughts and prayers through the week. We're all finding our way through these days, and pray that you're finding your way okay as well. These are very odd days, and it's a time for us to remember to be kind to each other as everyone tries to make their best decisions about what to do, um, find their way through this. Um, you know, one thing that I, I remember is that everybody uh, has reasons for what they do. And so uh, it becomes so important for us to uh, take time to try to understand others and why they do what they do and uh, get at uh, what the core um, motivators are for people. So I pray that you're finding your way through this and that uh, you're making the best choices you can. And uh, let's remember the kindness of God to us in this time, that uh, God is uh, one who knows our hearts and has chosen to be kind and gracious to us in all of the decisions that we've made and many of which uh, ought to have been done differently. And so here we are to give thanks to God and to find God's grace in Jesus Christ and to share that with others. And so pray that you're well today and that you're finding a way to move forward in God's grace to you. It is um, Memor uh, Veterans Day, Veterans Day this week. And we are grateful for those of you who have served in the military and uh, contributed to our well-being and our safety. And so we're going to take a moment today for a, a brief video, and then we'll say a prayer for our veterans. So we do want to express thanks and gratitude to all those who serve. Normally, we would have them stand for a moment and be recognized, and uh, we'd offer prayer. So let me at least offer prayer in this time. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to this Veterans Day for 2020, uh, such an odd year, and uh, we are grateful for those who have given of themselves in service to others. Lord, this year we think of essential workers as people who give of themselves for others. And we're particularly mindful of veterans today who put their lives on the line at times for us. We pray that you would be with them, that you would give them all that they need, that we would recognize their service and we would provide for them uh, well. Especially, Lord, we pray for those for whom um, the scars and wounds of body and soul have continued. We pray your healing grace in their lives and that we would be instruments of your peace in the lives of others. And so grant us this grace this day, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And so we continue to reach out to members in phone calls and driveway visits. You know, we are very aware that we are all dealing with these days in different ways. Some people are out there every day as essential workers, and others are sheltering at home, not going out at all. 
It's very confusing what's happening with the numbers right now. Uh, some want to get back together right now. Others want to wait until we can meet again without masks or social distance. Not to mention we have a wide range of political and social views uh, in our congregation and the news and all the tensions of the election that have been. Some are very happy. Some are not happy at all. Uh, so it's a very good thing that we can come together around our shared faith in Christ and our desire to grow in faith and service, to be instruments of Christ's mercy in the world and to find ways that uh, God can use us to bring about a blessing for others. And we'll talk about a blessing intention today. So what we do here today is to try to get our hearts and minds back in a place of faith, of hope, and of love. We have said continually throughout this unusual time that these three remain, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, you can have all kinds of other things, but faith, hope, and love are the things that remain. They're the bedrock. They're the things that will sustain us. And so we come together into the presence of God to, to try to grow in those and remember that uh, when we don't know what else to do, we, we go back to faith, hope, and love. I hope that you'll use the notes that are provided here for later reading and reflection. Now, one of the positive things about how we do this is that you can work with the recordings and notes all through the week. And there are links to videos and songs and articles throughout. So let me share with you one of the sanity anchors uh, for me this past week. And it, it's really the grounding of simple things, of simple moments in life. So I was looking out my backyard uh, this week, and I was watching a blue jay take a bath in our outdoor fountain. And, uh, you know, we work at trying to keep water in there and keep it, the leaves out of it and all, uh, so that it's available to the birds, right? It's a simple, simple thing. And it made me happy to see the blue jay in there just rinsing and, and taking a bath and then flying into and then flying back, um, contributing to nature, somehow connecting with the world around me, contributing to the world. You know, those two things are really basic to our happiness, being connected and contributing in some way, being part of, of something larger and making a contribution to the well-being of it. And uh, so connecting and contributing are so important. You know, for thousands of years, human beings were closer to nature uh, every day. And the last couple of hundred years have seen us increasingly separated from uh, and taking from nature. And it helps me to stay sane, uh, to walk outdoors, to see the leaves, to watch the birds, to watch the sunrises, sunsets, and to put water it out for our blue jays. And so I pray that uh, you'll be able to connect with the basic things and, and find a way to contribute. And really that brings some happiness to our lives as we participate in God's creation together. And so let's remember in our recovery moment that we are not God. We are not in control of others. Uh, the serenity prayer reminds us of this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. And so we can manage our own hearts and our minds. That's basic uh, to what we do. When we can't draw happiness from the outside, we draw it from the inside. When we can't draw stability and comfort from the outside, we find it from inside as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, as we choose joy, as we choose faith and hope and love, as we connect with the God who gives us uh, all things. It says in scripture, gives us all things that we need for life and godliness. And so we need to be centered and guarding our hearts and minds in this time. And then we can live in faith, in hope and in love. And so this morning, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God together. Let me offer an opening prayer. Let's pray. God who sends the sunshine and the rain on the just and the unjust, 
You are complete and perfect in your love for all you have made. And you send us into the world to participate in your desire for all to be well for all. And so in these odd days, guide us to hold a core commitment to the well-being of all that we meet, to hold a blessing intention. For we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite Amy to come with our opening songs today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the songs I have today speak of all the love that God shares to us and also for us to share to others. Um, so I'm going to start with a song called No Greater Love. shine down come around and live in us for the close and the far away I'm sharing is a familiar one. Hold us together. It 
Everybody, I'll see you at the end of the service. Really appreciate the songs that uh, we brought today. Amy brought us today. Love will hold us together. Everything's going to be all right. And uh, I was reflecting on uh, one of the uh, Christian uh, women of the past, uh, Teresa of Avila. And if you want to look up some church history, you can look up uh, Teresa. And uh, she had a saying that all will be well and all manners of things shall be well. And it was uh, in her life, the way Jesus brought comfort to her to say that all will be well. And so we believe this, that God is at work in our lives and that uh, we are called to a love that holds us together. And that uh, when we think about uh, being our brother's keeper, we reflect on the story in the uh, Genesis, Cain and Abel, as the first brothers, the first brothers in the Old Testament, in the human race, in the uh, account of Genesis, uh, become angry with each other. And, uh, and the one, uh, Cain kills Abel, and uh, God asks uh, him, where's your brother? And, and Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And of course, Jesus answers that question for us in the parable of the Good Samaritan that we'll look at together today, that we indeed are called together in the world to be our brother's keeper, to uh, work together, uh, to develop God's world and to be a blessing to all. And so uh, we'll think about that today in our message. I wanna take a moment though, Occasionally, we have uh, brought the Apostles' Creed to this service, and it just becomes a moment to reflect on the basics of our faith. And so let me just uh, share this as we use it as a grounding for us to remember that uh, we believe in God, right? So it says, I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So we believe that there is a personal or tripersonal God who exists. And we can know this God, we can relate to this God, and God has called us in Jesus Christ to that. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And to know God is, is essential to our lives. Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And so we believe that God came among us. We're starting to work already on our Christmas uh, Advent services, and I appreciate the team that's uh, already getting underway for that, um, that we believe that God came among us in uh, Jesus Christ. He came into our human flesh, and he became the mediator who could create peace with God. So I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And so no greater love has anyone than this, that we lay down our life for our friends, he says. And he descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. And so we believe in resurrection. We believe that God brings uh, light out of darkness, brings life out of death, that God is a God of life and light. And uh, Jesus rose on the third day. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. The future is secure. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit who comes to us to unite us with Christ, to bring the, the grace and the power of God, the wisdom of God into our lives. The Holy Catholic Church, the, the worldwide church of Jesus Christ, that we're called from every nation, every language, every ethnicity, all kinds of people into the church. And the communion of saints that we share in this together. And the forgiveness of sins that lets us move forward in life the resurrection of the body, which is our hope as we struggle with our illnesses and weaknesses and the life everlasting. Amen. And so the, the creed is, is a glorious reflection of core truths for us. And so I pray that those will be um, comforting for you this day as well. So let me come to the scripture today and introduce the scripture. So uh, you're aware that I choose scriptures weeks, sometimes months in advance for the services. And I've got our services laid out all the way through the end of the year. And uh, it's always very interesting how the things that get chosen intersect with the things that are happening. And uh, as I was preparing for this Sunday over the past month, I knew it would be the Sunday after the election. And I wondered what word from God might be useful to us, however things turned out, because we don't know, and we didn't know. And so we had no, and I finished this message and put the notes up before we had any idea. So we had no way of knowing what kind of world we might be living in today. And there would be changes in the pandemic that we could not predict, and there would be changes in the political situation that we could not predict. And so I wrote this message so that it would work no matter how the election turned out or what was going on with the pandemic. So it seemed good to focus on something that would be helpful and true, no matter what happened in either case. You know, and I've become more aware that a lot of scripture is like that, that it applies in all kinds of situations, whether we like them or whether we don't. As Paul says in the book of Philippians, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. He says, we can't control everything. Some things you'll like, some things you won't like. But whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So the gospel is the, the base of our contentment, our happiness, our life, not all of the things that happen around us. And uh, thinking about uh, how so many differences are leading people to anger and hatred towards others, uh, being upset. The words of the Apostle John seem so meaningful. And there's a very small section of scripture at the, just before Revelation called 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So they're letters of the Apostle John. We're more familiar with the Gospel of John, but there are these letters uh, where he's writing to friends. And uh, in 3 John, there's this tiny little letter, and he begins that by saying this. He writes the letter, and he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. And uh, I, I thought about that. I said, that's a blessing intention. That's John, who was so close to Jesus, sometimes called the apostle of love, he says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well, that you may be well in body and soul in your circumstances. That's my hope for you, my prayer for you. And I, once I started thinking about this, 
It connected to Jesus' words about God's perfection. And so it's, it's very interesting when Jesus says to us that we should be perfect, he has something very specific in mind, God's perfection in love for others. And, is, and then Jesus tells a parable of the Good Samaritan. So whatever happened this week, uh, I figured we could point to the call to us as Christians to seek the well-being of those that we agree with and that we disagree with, to see people not as one side or another, but as people who are our neighbors and whose well-being is sought by Christ and by us. And so let me read these passages of Scripture. So we remember that Scripture is God-breathed. It's, it's amazing. It's given to us. It's, it's like a, it's got so many dimensions and so many applications and it's given to us to help us to know God, to find life in Christ and to have wisdom for living. And so these are the words of God uh, to us today. So from 3 John verse 2, it says this, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. And we'll come back to that. And then from the Gospels, uh, we read the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so he wants to know what's the most important things that God is requiring of us in the world. What is the, the core of what God wants? Jesus asks him, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Knowing that people read scripture differently. And some people point to this and some people point to that as the most important things. And so Jesus says, how do you read it? What, out of all of the things, what do you make the most important things? And uh, the person answers Jesus. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, there's, there's hundreds of chapters of the Bible but if you ask me what I think is the most important, Jesus, I think it's to love God and to love your neighbor. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, you're, you're reading it right. You're pulling out the most important things and putting them in the most important place. So of all the things you could read, you got it. You got the core of it. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. But the, the man goes on in the conversation with Jesus. He wanted to justify himself. So this is so impressive. So he wants to say, well, I'm good, right? I'm now that I read the scriptures, right? I'm good, right? I want to be confident that I'm doing this right. And uh, so uh, he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So if that's the most important thing, then what does that mean in my life? And so Jesus replied, and we all know this story, but it's uh, useful for us today. In reply, Jesus said to who is my neighbor, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And so this is um, a sad thing. I, I know working on the ambulance um, for years, and some of you all work in medical and ambulance uh, where you work in emergency rooms, and you see more of this than most most of us do. And I've seen a little bit of it, people who've been uh, hurt, beaten, 
shot, stabbed, right? All the all these things that we we see when we work in those services, and and they they are suffering, and they are uh, in danger of their lives. And so Jesus says, "I'll tell you a story." Then there's a man from Jerusalem uh, going down to Jericho. He's attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. He's lying by the side of the road, injured. And there's no EMS to go and pick him up. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, and this becomes the moment, right? He saw the man and he passed by on the other side. He got as far away from him as he could and he passed him by. And so the priest has got things to do. He reads scripture differently. He reads scripture that his leading worship is the most, and offering sacrifices is the most important thing. And so that's how he reads scripture. So he gets away from this guy. I've got to go serve God. And that doesn't mean helping this person. And so off he goes. And then uh, he says, uh, uh, so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So now here's another religious person, another Levite who is busy with God's stuff and he reads the scripture differently. And he says, well, I I have responsibilities and things that God wants me to do. So I have no, this is not what God wants me to do. So he passes by, gets as far away as he can and passes by on the other side. That says, then Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, who, so he's on his way somewhere. He's got things to do. He's got business. As he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. So we would say today he had empathy. He had compassion. And he shows mercy. He does something about it. So it says he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So he takes his own resources that he might need for himself and he cares for this other person that he encountered along the way. He sees himself as his brother's keeper. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. So he he helps him to feel, uh, to start to recover. And the next day, He took out two denarii, which is two days uh, wages. A denarii was a day's wage. He takes two days wages and gives them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. So he asks somebody else and he supports somebody else to help take care of him. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So I'm going to come back. And I'll throw in whatever else we need because we are going to take care of this person. And so Jesus asks the man then who asked, well, who's my neighbor? Uh, Which of these three, he says, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So this is one of those things that Jesus says. He says, if you want to know what the most important things to do with God are, you love God. And that love for God leads to a love for neighbor that looks for empathy for those who've been gotten a tough run of it in life. And you help them to recover and to be well. And uh, you have an intention for their wellness. And uh, we'll talk about that in our message today. So I'm going to invite Amanda to come and share with us the uh, Bible story she's working with the children. Good morning, everyone. Um, It's good to be here this morning. Um, This morning, we are reading again from our Growing in God's Love Story Bible. And we are continuing reading through Genesis um, and continuing our story of Sarah and Abraham. So we are, this morning we are reading God Made Sarah Laugh. Do you remember the last time you laughed so hard that your whole body shook? 
listen to this story about Sarah's deep belly laugh. Sarah and Abraham had been traveling a long time. They stopped and set up their tents. The bright afternoon sun was hot. Abraham was sitting under the shade of the big trees when he spotted three visitors. He ran to greet them. Abraham said to them, come rest in the shade of my tree. I will bring water to wash your feet. I will bring you a meal to make you stronger for your journey. The visitors said that they had a message for Sarah. Abraham ran to her, use the best flour we have and bake something delicious for our visitors. Sarah began to knead the dough. Then Abraham ran to the place where the cattle were kept and took the best one from the herd to his servant. Prepare the best calf and make a delicious meal for our visitors. The servant quickly stoked the fire. Abraham gathered milk and butter. When the bread was baked and the meat was cooked, Abraham served their visitors. Sarah took a deep breath and listened from inside the tent as the visitors ate. She heard them ask, where is Sarah? Abraham replied, Sarah is right here in the tent. Sarah was about to poke her head out to say hello when she heard the visitor say, I will come back to see you and Sarah in one year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was, uh, a loud laugh burst from deep inside Sarah's belly. How in the world could I, I have a baby? My old body can't have a baby. God spoke through the visitor. Why did you laugh? What if God could make this promise come true? In one year, I'll return. Sarah will have a son. And do you know what? Sarah's baby was born when she was very old. Sarah held her baby close. She looked into his beautiful face. She said, God made me laugh. I believed this day would never come, but now you're here. I will call you Isaac because it means laughter. I want to remember how I laughed forever. So this story reminds us how nothing is too hard for God. This week, we want to try to look for ways that God is keeping his promises and working in unexpected ways. All right, have a great week. Bye. And we're so grateful for the uh, work that you do and for the families that participate and the kids. And so, hi, kids. And uh, I'm so glad that you can work with Amanda on these uh, Bible stories and learn these wonderful things. One of the things that we point out in that story of Abram, Abraham and Sarah and the visitors is the hospitality that they extended. Uh, that is a part of another culture more than it's part of ours, that when people were traveling, and even as strangers, there you would meet them and you would you would welcome them. So I want you to think about for a minute, what is it that you want? What is it that you think about uh, through the day and, and kind of guides your action and, and the direction of your life? What is it you want? When I was in high school, I, the answer was really easy. I wanted a car, right? Uh, like all high school kids, I wanted a car so I could get out and go places and be on my own a bit. And uh, and you know how this goes, right? Eventually I got a car and then I got another car and then I got another car. And uh, and a car brought some good things, uh, but it brought lots of bills uh, for insurance and gas and repairs as well. And so sometimes when we get what we want, we find it's not always exactly what we thought it would be. What we want sets in motion our actions. I wanted the car, I saved some money, I looked for cars uh, for sale and I bought a car. What I wanted shaped what I thought about, what I saw and what I did. And so it becomes very important for us to think about our wantings because what we want sets in motion so much of the rest of our lives. We should pay attention to what it is that we really want. As Christians, we look to Jesus to guide our lives. What did he want? What did he want us to want? What does God want from us? That question was asked to Jesus by a lawyer. What is it that God really wants? I mean, there's a whole Bible here. There's all kinds of things in it. What is it that God really wants most of all? That's a very big question. 
Christians have had many different things that have been most important to them over the years. Uh, Christians uh, made a big deal about rock and roll music at one point. I remember traveling and we were in Cleveland, Ohio, looking, we were going to look at colleges for the kids. And uh, we stopped at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And there was a big display there of uh, a time when the churches were against rock and roll music. And that was the thing that was most important to them. And they had times when youth groups came together and burned the records. And that was what the church made a big deal about. Um, and then hundreds of years before that, the church Christians made a big deal about taking back Jerusalem from the infidel hordes. And that led to holy wars uh, from the 1100s to the 1300s of the Crusades uh, for a couple hundred years where Christians took up their swords and went out and killed other people because they felt that was the most important thing that God wanted from us. Christians made a big deal about lots of things. And you can, you can fill in the blanks about what Christians have made a big deal about. But when Jesus was asked about the big deal, he said that there were two things that were really big deals to God that ought to be big deals to us, to love God and to love our neighbors. And when someone wanted to get more specific about that, well, what do you mean by that? Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, in that story, of course, there are two religious people in the story who just don't get it. They come across a suffering man and they want to go by without doing anything about that because they are concerned about other things. They want other things. They have other things on their mind than caring for the neighbor. They have important religious things to do. They have to lead worship. They have to do the sacrifices. They have to care for the temple. That's what God wants from us. And so they walk by on the other side. Those are what they want, and that's more important to them than caring for the suffering stranger. Now, there's another person in the story who does get it, who understands the way Jesus reads the scripture. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan, we say. And uh, we all know this story. The good Samaritan stops, and he relieves the suffering. He shows mercy on the suffering man. He was on his way somewhere else to do something else. He had other things he wanted. But at some deep level, this was core to what he wanted. This was a most important want. The most important level of his life, he wanted to care for others. And so he stops and says, of all the things that I could do, of all the things that God talks about doing, this is the most important. And he stops. We know that the Samaritans were lower social status people in Jesus' time. They were looked down on. They were rejected by the higher status people of their time. They knew what it felt like to be on the outside, to be rejected. So somehow this fellow who knew what it's like to be on the outside and to be rejected, now people go on the other side of the road and go by him, he had decided that what he wanted was to help his neighbors not to feel rejected and passed by in their suffering. He wanted to be connected, he wanted to contribute, and he wanted to show empathy. And he thought, this is the thing that God above all else wants from me. And so Jesus says, go and do likewise. And so from the perspective of our wants, Jesus puts a love for God and neighbor that wants to see people well and whole as central, as a core thing for our Christian life. This is what God wants us to want. And I think the apostle John, who was one of the closest disciples to Jesus, understood this. He was writing a letter to a friend that we still have today that was placed in our holy books, our holy library, the Bible, all 66 books. This is one of the books. And in that book, he says to his friend in the second verse, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul 
is getting along well. John got it. John understood how to read the scriptures the way Jesus read the scriptures. His faith shaped his life into being a person who wished wellness and wholeness for the other. Good health, a soul that is well, all will be well. I'm so reminded of church history and Teresa of Avila. If you read church history, there was a woman of faith who was somewhat famous and, uh, and she and her writings struggled with uh, suffering and with uh, her own failure in life. And she felt that Jesus came to her at one point and said, sin is, is here, it's, it's, it's gonna be here, but all will be well and all manner of things will be well. And so it seems like she understood uh, what John has said here, be your friends. I pray that you may be well in good health and all manner of things will be well for you. I wanna to suggest to you today that as we go through this pandemic and this political transition, that we take this as our intention for others. I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. And we might have that intention, that want for everybody that we come across. You know, for years I've tried to practice this in all sorts of situations. When I'm driving and I see others, I pray that for them. I pray that you may be in good health, that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well, that you will find fullness of life that God desires for you, that you will come to know that life in Christ. That's my intention, my want, as I drive down the street and I see people. When I go to stores and I wait in lines, I pray this for others there, the checkout person, even those who are lying in front of me and who are slowing me down, I pray this for them. I pray that you may enjoy good health and, and all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. When I gather with consistory and when we gather for worship, this is a core want. I pray that you may be well in body and soul in all of your circumstances, that it may be well with you. And then I do what I can to contribute to that because that's what I want. And that guides then my actions for you. How can I be part of connecting with and contributing to your wellness? Jesus had this kind of prayer for others. Instead of being judgmental and condemning and hateful towards others, Jesus wanted us to pray and act for them to be well in all things. In fact, he says this is how we should be perfect. Listen to Jesus. He says this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so judging others is not the core priority for us to be pleasing God. And he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so, and Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so reading scripture, the first priority is not hating enemies, but it's loving enemies and praying for those who persecute us. Jesus says this then, he says, so that you may be children of your father in heaven. So he says, this is what God is like. And if you're a child of God, then this is what you would be like too. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So God doesn't say, okay, you get sunshine and you don't get sunshine. You get rain for your crops and you don't get rain for your crops depending on your righteousness or unrighteousness or your uh, enemies or, or friends. He, he says, I'm going to give it all of you. I'm going to give you all the things you need to be well. And so Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, he says, as your heavenly father is perfect. So, so to be perfect doesn't mean that you 
all kinds of other things that we talk about being perfect about. It means that like God, you offer gifts to all the people you meet that they may be well. That's being perfect, complete in God's love, the way your heavenly father is perfect. That the heart of God is a desire for all people and all things to be well in body and in circumstances. And might it be good for us in this time of tension and polarization to recover the perfection of God in seeking the good of all. These are sometimes called intentions. People who have thought a lot about this say that we should be very careful about the intentions we set. One old saying puts it this way, you are what your deepest desire is. As your desire is, so is your intention. And as your intention is, so is your will. And as your will is, so is your deed. And as your deed is, so is your destiny. We might simply say it this way, you reap what you sow. The prayers and intentions that you put in your heart give rise to your life and to the world that you help to create. Paul the Apostle put it this way, set your heart and your mind on things above. Or the book of Proverbs says this, guard your heart, for out of it is the whole course of your life that flows out from your heart. As Christians, we are told that God is love and that God desires that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God's intention gives rise to action. God sent his son into the world to be our savior. Jesus lived and died and rose so that we could know God more fully and be at peace with God, that we could be well. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they shall be called the children of God. They bear the character of their heavenly parent. So when we hear John begin his letter with these words, may it be well with you. We see the intention that John had towards his friend in 3 John. It seems to me that this is a good intention for us to take up. You know, others have recommended this. There's a famous prayer in Eastern religions that goes like this. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never be disconnected from the supreme happiness, which is without suffering. And may they remain in the boundless balance, free from both attachment to close ones and rejection of others. A balanced, content life in which all is well. That's the intention that that prayer asks. And so in the season of pandemic and the political challenges that we face, what is it that God wants most from us? How do you read the scriptures? I think that God is calling the church to show up as a community that seeks the well-being of every person. To demonstrate the perfection of a God who sends the rain and the, the sun on the just and the unjust to hold an intention and a prayer for the well-being of each person. And to see those on the opposite side of the pandemic views and say, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting long well. To see those on the opposite side of your political views and say, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well, that they will have happiness and the causes of happiness, that they will be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. Perhaps by showing up in this way, we will commend our Christian faith and find that others think better of Christ and his people. And perhaps we can show up as the very presence of Christ in a lost and broken world so loved by God, to which God says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. I think as we close today, let's take a minute to repeat that as a prayer. As you think about those you love and those you don't, maybe hold in your mind someone you get along with 
and someone you don't. Let's set our intention here. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Amen. Let's pray together. God who has shown us mercy, who has given us all we need for life and godliness in Christ, grant to us the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of John to seek that all may be well for all that we meet. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. And so we come to our time of prayer. Let's continue to pray for Eric, who's been in and out of the hospital. Let's pray for Richie as uh, he and Kathy travel back and as he recovers from uh, an injury to his hip. Let's pray for others that we carry on our hearts today and for our nation in these days of uh, finding our way. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray together for our world this day. We know that you love the world so much that you gave us Christ. And Christ helped us understand how to read the scriptures, how to uh, find in it at the center a love for God and a love for our neighbor. And so, Lord, we pray that these would be the center for us, that empathy and compassion and an intention for blessing might be what we take up at the core of our Christian life. And so, Lord, we pray for our world. We are mindful of much suffering in our world. We pray that uh, people will be well, that they would have causes of wellness in their lives, that they would be set free from suffering. Lord, we pray for all those who work to relieve the suffering of the world. We pray for people who suffer from illness, from poverty. We pray for refugees. Lord, we pray for those grieving the loss of loved ones. Lord, help us to be a healing part of your work in their lives. Lord, we pray for our nation today. In the time when we are past the election, we pray for grace for all of us to come together and to find healing, to find a way to see each other, not as enemies, but as friends, and to find ways to seek the well-being of all. And so give our elected officials wisdom that we might live in peace, in justice, and in truth and freedom. Lord, we pray for our community. We ask for all in our community who uh, struggle to find their way through this difficult time. We ask you to be with uh, us as we seek to be instruments of grace and family promise and our food ministry, our deacons, and all that uh, we do to try to relieve suffering. Lord, we pray together for the concerns we have on our hearts, and we take a minute to lift them to you. Lord, for all of your gifts to us, we are deeply grateful for the way that you have given to us what we need to be well. Lord, fill our hearts with gratitude that we might connect and contribute to others, that we might show up as disciples, even as we remember the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so I'm going to invite Amy to come back for our uh, closing hymn. Hey, hello again, guys. <laughs> Annie's playing in the background. Makes her happy. And so I'm going to sing uh, our closing song called Good Grace, where it just calls people together. Um, neighbors, strangers, we're all one together. So Good Grace.
guys have a great week so what an odd and frustrating day for me at least here and so i'll be back at 11 and uh, hopefully my internet will be back and uh, we can do the service well but i pray that you'll uh, look at the notes very important i think what what i wanted to bring today Let me offer this benediction. People of Jesus Christ, as you go this day, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day and every day. Amen. And so remember to reach out if you're in need, and uh, we have resources, and uh, we find our way through obstacles, and we go forward. All will be well. And so God bless you as you go.